Yeah, good morning. Welcome to our study today. And as you can see, we're going to be doing things a little different today. Um, our Sunday study has been focused on the Gospel of Mark, and our Wednesday study had just recently begun studying Peter's first epistle. However, with the rise of COVID-19 and with uh, many, many people self-quarantining and unable to come out, uh, it was becoming very difficult to study, to properly study these texts, and uh, to be able to include everybody. Even with this great technology that we have, um, some of our, our faithful were being excluded. They just simply don't have access to these materials. So what we're going to do is we're going to do things different today. I wanted to do a very topical study, and um, we're going to examine a, a medieval piece of artwork. It's called the Eisenheim Altarpiece, as you can see. It's right here. Um, this is an ancient piece of work. Uh, it was produced or, or painted by Matthias Grunwald. Uh, he's from Eisenheim, Germany, which is over on the, the French-German uh, border. Uh, this was constructed and painted in 15, between 1512 and 1516. It is a oil on, on wood piece of work, and it, it, it's huge. I think I have the dimensions coming up here. But uh, the reason they did altarpieces is these big, long cathedrals, these huge churches, they didn't necessarily have a, a uh, like like a little formal crucifix always. What they did, they had these old, huge altarpieces. And the churches, by the way, also served as hospitals. That I mean, you had one central agency in town. It was the church, it was the hospital, and um, the monks and the priests, they served as the caregivers. They were truly, and, and the nuns, we can't forget them, they were the, uh, the hands of mercy, so to speak. This altarpiece was constructed or commissioned specifically for the Eisenheim Church slash hospital. And that church was built by the Brothers of St. Anthony, by monks. Okay, uh, For those of you who don't know, as I have here, St. Anthony was the patron saint of everyone who was suffering from skin diseases, uh, be it leprosy or acne or whatever. He was the patron saint. If you wanted your skin disease cleared up, you prayed to St. Anthony, and hopefully he would intercede for you. Now, the theology there is wrong, but you understand uh, what's going on here. God worked good out of some bad theology, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Uh, at the Eisenheim Parish, the Eisenheim Hospital, <laughs> same thing, the monks were devoted to the care of sick and dying peasants, okay? And the lesions they were suffering with, uh, bubonic plague, right? And uh, ergotism, it's called. It's a, a skin disease that was brought about by consuming rye that's been infected with fungus, a certain type of fungus. Uh, bubonic plague was ravaging the area. So a lot of... Uh, black boils, things of that nature. People were dying. They were being brought to this sanctuary. And they didn't, as I will show you, they didn't have pews or anything. The people were being brought before there. So you can see in this picture. Um, and they would lay in this big hall with this big altarpiece. Oh, there it is. Uh, size, uh, just the center panel there, mind you, about 10 foot by 11 foot. And the people were laid out. This was um, the, the nave slash hospital. And they would look and they would behold. And they would see this beautiful image of Christ. Uh, and as you will come to see, he is covered in the plague. His body is ravaged with the wounds of and lesions of the plague and ergotism. So it's really cool. Um, the people, as they're laying there, basically getting ready to take their last breath here on earth, and their next breath will be a breath of heavenly air, they're looking at Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, who's afflicted with the, the same disease they have. And that may not sound comforting, uh, but we're going to talk about it. There is outstanding theology here. You know, a picture paints a thousand words or says a thousand words, right? Um, this beautiful artwork, as most of the artwork in that time, it just, it proclaims the gospel better than I could ever do, better than I think the whole seminary of professors could do. So with that, let's, uh, let's push on. Uh, there are multiple, this is like a folding 
thing, okay? You can see the panels here on the right, they fold open and closed. And right now, what you're looking at is the closed portion, okay? So you see that little line down the middle. Those panels open up. This is the closed position. So on the left, you have St. Sebastian, um, who is, uh, he's renowned for his suffering. I, I didn't zoom in on it at all, but colors mean everything too, by the way. So you see a lot of red. Red represents... Um, death, and martyrdom, love, all right? It, it, it's very agape love. So uh, it's not just this morbid kind of death. There is this great sense of love and martyrdom and devotion. So on the left hand, you see St. Sebastian. Now, if I would have zoomed in, you could see uh, specifically he is pierced with arrows, uh, filled with arrows. That's um, allegedly or the legend has it that's how he was put to death he was basically facing a firing squad of archers so there he stands victorious um, pierced with arrows but alive and well and on the right then you have saint anthony the patron saint saint anthony he's covered in red and um, he's the one for whom you know the brothers are devoted to the order of saint anthony and they built this this uh church this hospital and then in the center, you have the crucifixion of Christ. All right, we're going to talk more about that, and you'll see the figures there. It, it's beautiful theology. And at the very bottom, this, this kind of cool curved area, this long area, that's called the predella. And uh, more imagery. Everything is designed to tell a story. So now when these panels open up, as you can see, it goes from the closed position to the open position, you have the whole story of Christ from beginning to end. All right on the left, you have the Annunciation, the angel coming, all these bright colors. Can you see the difference between the, the bright colors of Christ and then the dark colors of his death? It's beautiful stuff. So on the left, you have these very joyous colors. The, the angel is appearing to Mary. Mary is portrayed as this young girl, and she's got this dark navy blue slash green dress on. You know, it's, it's full of hope. It's full of life. Green represents life like a garden, okay? Uh, so you can see the angel coming to her and announcing this, this uh, and she's reading the Bible. That's what's on her lap there, if you look closely. So you have the Annunciation to the Virgin. In the big center panel, you have uh, basically the nativity scene, right? You have uh, all of uh, heaven and earth is rejoicing. You have uh, the the wise men and everything coming to visit Mary, and Mary there is on the right side of the center panel with with the baby Jesus. The colors again mean everything. You have this great martyrdom and love, unconditional love, and the the blue of royalty and hope. If you look up there, you have God the Father smiling down upon his son. And then on the right, you have the resurrection panel. And we're going to put our focus there today. So you have the whole timeline, right? The Annunciation, the birth, and the resurrection. And when you close it, you have the death of Jesus. And, and I do love how Grunwald set this up. Um, and, and at the bottom, obviously, we have always the, the death or the body of Christ. The, the uh, Corpus Christi is always ever before us because without the death of Christ, we have nothing, right? There's, a, there's an old Lutheran forefather who said this, that I, I, I love the saying. I've been actually thinking about it the last few days since Easter. Um, Jesus Christ uh, has risen from the dead. He died and rose from the dead. Uh, nothing else matters. And then he also goes on to say, if Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead, nothing else matters. It's really a cool way of looking at it, right? Um, but here you have the, the, the Corpus Christi in the predella. It's ever before us. And I like the way that Grunewald set this up, because when the panels are closed, you only see the crucified Christ. When the panels are open, you see the resurrected Christ. You know, there's this mystery. We know the other side of it, but you never see both sides together. Kind of like the life we're living right now, right? You, you know, we, we see the ugly side of things, but we never see in full, at least, the resurrection. We know it's there. We know it's there. If you open the panel, you know, like if we got a glimpse behind the veil, got to look behind the panel, we could see the full glory. 
And I do wonder how different things would be if we could actually see the full glory that awaits us. You know, would we kind of buckle down and and um, patiently, quietly go about our, our cross-bearing? Instead of right now, it's like everything seems so uncertain, which, you know, it's it's faith. Faith is trusting in the things that aren't seen. Well, we don't necessarily see all our glory and all our joy, do we? So it's easy to lament and cry out. We we kind of only see the Corpus Christi side of things, and we don't see the the uh, Christus Victor, the the victorious, resurrected Christ side of things. And I think if we saw the or kept our face eye centered on the Christus Victor side of things, it it might change things for us. But moving on, anyway, I digress. There's the Predella. Um, they say it's the a lamentation panel so it's always before the reason it's always before us it's uh it wants to show you gruenwald wants to basically sprawl out for you the horrifying experience that christ went through for you the, the right i put there the horrifyingly punctured corpus christi the body of christ and you can see the the greenish death hue and I love the background, right? He, there's, it's like it almost takes place in a garden. You know, they're taking his body down. You say, well, yeah, that's at the, the garden tomb. Well, not necessarily. Don't go there yet. Uh, but you see his greenish death hue, it very much matches the greenish hue of the garden. This is old Adam, you know, almost like almost like a dust to dust. We know Christ's body doesn't see decay and he rises again victoriously, but you can see the new Adam um, taking the place of the old Adam. Uh, uh, his life is conquering death. It's beautiful stuff. Now, again, here is a great picture. You can see the pock marks, okay, of the plague. These are this is not whip marks and everything that Grunwald is displaying because he looked out on the legs and everything. This is plague marks. This is what Jesus went through. Okay, and then I give you the Hebrews. Uh, passage. The reason, again, is it's in the predella. It's an ever-present, constant invitation, invitation to, to contemplate your mortality, to comp- contemplate your mortality and your resurrection in Christ. Okay. Now, the fact that he's portrayed as the plague victim, again, I give you the two passages out of Hebrews. And it's so sad. This is so often missed by, uh, by people. He, the art scholars uh, who really don't have a uh, theological background, they tend to miss this. They, they chalk it up to um, superstition. People would look at, look at this and be healed. And it's like, no, that's not at all what's going on here. This is great comfort. Um, this is what Grunewald had in mind. And that's in his own words. And he, Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful, faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And you also hear in Hebrews chapter 4, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, as I told you, when you're laying in that that room, that nave, and you look and you behold Christ who's afflicted in every way like you are, you can have faith that just as he became as you are, you will become as he is, right? We have the joy of our resurrection to look forward to because just as we were baptized into his death, we were also baptized into his resurrection. Romans 6 language. So something to keep in mind. Now, as we push forward, let's go back and we're going to focus on the crucifixion panel. All right, this is panel closed, center panel, crucifixion panel. This is where our focus is. And there's some beautiful stuff going on here. So we're going to go down to the bottom left corner. And there we see the figures. What was Grunewald going for here? Well, we have... uh, in the red, that is John, the young John, John the evangelist, right? The one whom Jesus loved. So Grunwald includes him. Notice he's wearing red. Uh, again, this is agape love, unconditional love. Uh, this is also martyrdom, sim- symbolic of martyrdom. So you have John, and he's holding Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay, And, and this is right out of the Gospels, right? right out of the book of John. 
Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And from that moment on, John took Mary home to be his mother, and he took care of her. Um, now, if you notice, Mary, she's wearing, again, that dark green, dark blue, so that kind of royalty, hope, life underneath, okay? It's not a black dress. I know it kind of appears black, but it's a dark green. So she's she's in mourning, but she is considered, you, you see life springing forth from her womb. She's covered over in white, okay? White represents purity, very baptismal. Now, in this sense, you, you can see uh, what Grunewald was going for. She looks like a nun. Uh, she would have looked exactly like one of the nuns, one of the, the nurses, taking care of the people and and out of this humble little woman comes life the gift of life now down this young girl with the long flowing blonde hair and uh, the orange dress that is mary magdalene now grunwald includes her and there's there's some um there's a little error in his theology, but it, that theological air persists to this day among many people. There's a lot of arguments that go on. Mary Magdalene, as you can see, she's got this little um, alabaster flask there. Now, it, uh, you say, well, that's not the traditional alabaster flask. Those of you who might know your your history, uh, your art history, whatever you want to call it, no, that is not the traditional-looking uh, Roman Hebrew alabaster flask. That looks like the flask that the, that the nurses would carry, their balms, their ointments in to care for them. So Mary Magdalene is carrying uh, an ointment jar no different than what all the nurses were carrying. Now, the reason I said there's some poor theology in here is if you look, she's got blonde hair. Uh, well, chances are that's not the case uh, with the real Mary Magdalene. Um, and she's wearing an orange dress. The reason that Grunewald chooses this is because the long flowing locks, okay, uncovered flowing locks, uh, there's a sense of um, kind of, of, of uh, beauty, okay? She's pure, Um a woman back then would cover her hair because she was uh, of maritable age or, or of marriage, okay? Um, now, there are some who would say, well, no, and, and the, the women of, of ill repute, kind of loose morals, they wouldn't cover their hair, and they'd have their hair all out and make a big display. And a lot of people like to think that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, and that is simply not backed up anywhere in Scripture. We are told that Jesus had exercised seven demons from her and that she was with them all the time, but we're never told that she was a prostitute, ever. Uh, a lot of people look to Luke chapter— this is another reason, by the way, she's portrayed here. This is lore. This is legend. Okay, She's portrayed wearing an orange dress. There's a combination of the, the uh, uh, red and yellow— right? Just mix your colors there, kindergartners. Red and yellow make orange. Yellow was the color of prostitutes. That was like the official color. If you were a prostitute, you had to wear yellow. So the thought is, is that Grunewald purposely puts her in this long flowing orange robe because yes, she's this faithful martyr with great love for Jesus, but she's also a prostitute. So with her long flowing seductress type of hair and her orange thing, her orange dress, she is the woman, they say, out of Luke chapter 7, who shows up and cries and anoints Jesus' feet with, his, with her alabaster flask, and she wets his feet with tears and dries his feet with her long hair. That's what Grunewald's going for. She's, she's kneeling down, okay? Her posture is very short in, in comparison to everybody else to show how life is short. Again, you know, there's lots of symbolism here. Now, is this really Mary Magdalene? Well, first off, did Mary Magdalene look like that? No. Is it Mary Magdalene in the sense that uh, she's the woman in Luke chapter 7? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. As a matter of fact, if you look, the woman in Luke chapter 7 is anonymous. The woman out of Matthew and Mark chapter 14, we know that that's Mary, the sister of Martha. And Mary Magdalene is somebody completely different. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. 
uh, again, we're looking for what he's going for, what, what uh, the theology that, that uh, Gruenwald's trying to teach her. And there is outstanding theology just in this little portion. Now, if we switch to the right-hand corner, here's where you see that uh, there's great theology, and yet it is completely what I call, well, not what I call, the term is anachronistic. Uh, you can hear the word chronology in there, so timeline-wise, and then ana means kind of above or out of. So to be anachronistic means it's out of time. It doesn't work. John the Baptist was obviously not present at Jesus' crucifixion. John the Baptist had been beheaded about a year before, maybe even a year and a half before the crucifixion of Jesus. But you can see the good theology here. That's why can Mary Magdalene have yellow hair, and can Mary Magdalene be portrayed as this kind of every woman or, or sinful woman who's so thankful for her sins and cries and wets Jesus' feet? Sure, all of this works. Now, if we see, this is John the Baptist, and he's holding in his book, the, holding in his hand the word of God, and he's pointing to the crucified Christ. This is really cool. The one who is being put to death, the one who's covered in plague sores, and John the Baptist is pointing to him and saying in the Latin there, Iliam aportat crescere me automanui, which means he must increase and I must decrease. Now, you need to think about that. He is pointing to the plague-ridden, crucified Jesus and says, he must increase and I must decrease. I must lower myself to this. Because behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? And then we look down. And again, John the Baptist is wearing red, representing the, the um, uh, agape love, the, the martyrdom aspect. We see the lamb, that, that innocent lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, very revelation language there. He's, he's bearing the cross, was dead but now lives, right? And if you look very closely at the lamb's chest, out of his chest is coming blood dripping into the chalice. So when we look to Christ, we see the living one, you know, who's still out of his side comes water and blood, right? So you have baptism, you have communion. The, the blood and water of the, of, out of Christ's riven side is still flowing forth to us today. Beautiful confession. Now, Christ's feet and the blood, I, I did want to point this out. You see fresh blood. I love what Grunewald's going for here. There's fresh blood, obviously, the, the red, bright red. There's also, you'd have to get very close to this, but you can see layers and layers of like old, dry blood, all right? There's this, uh, there's this sense that Grunewald is, is trying to tell you that Jesus has been doing this. He's been walking this death march since the Garden of Eden, hasn't he? When the Father promises that, yes, you may strike his heel, but he is going to crush your head. Our Lord has been walking this path to take our place since the foundation, since that first fall into sin. So you've got all this blood caked up and caked up and caked up, and now it's finally, there's the fresh blood coming out through the nail wound, right? Again, beautiful stuff. I love what he's going for here. Now, finally, we can center up here on the panel, put all the focus on Christ, right? You see at the top, that plaque, INRI, I-N-R-I, um, that's just Latin shorthand, kind of like NASA, uh, I, I believe that's called an anagram, um, National Aeronautical Space Administration, okay, uh, N-A-S-A, -A. well, INRI is the same thing, Jesus Nazarenos Rex Judarum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, now, look at just the, the details here are so awesome. Look at the, the priestly hands. He's got these, you know, kind of tormented hands. You just ran nails through the center of them. And of course, they're going to be all gnarled up and, and everything else. But they're in this very priestly pose. Okay, when the priest, when the pastor prays to God, when he offers up intercessory prayers to God at the altar on behalf of the people, he lifts his hands up, his palms to the sky. Here you have Christ 
lifting up his hands as the sacrifice. He is the priest offering up the sacrifice to God, which is himself on the altar that is his cross. Just, I mean, we could just focus on the hands and call it a day. It is so profound. Now, the hewn tree of the cross, right? This is, it's a gnarled, hewn tree. You know, here you see the, the tree of death and the tree of life, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life wrapped up in one with Christ. Um, so there, as I say, reference Romans then as well. You also have uh, the old Adam and the new Adam. From from the first Adam comes sin and death, and from the new Adam comes life. Now the backgrounds, the colors, the tones, all right, the river and the wilderness. If you look there, there's there's the river flowing. It's matching John the Baptist's hand, so to speak, so an uh, allusion to baptism. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. Uh, Jesus doesn't need baptizing, but all who are baptized into him have life, right? So you have this, this river representing, um, representing baptism and life. It, this is taking place. If you look, it, it kind of just fades away into desert wilderness. And so in the midst of the wilderness of sin and everything, here is life. Now the background, it's this whole crucifixion panel is set on a a background of of a really dark ghoulish black and green okay the greenish is like a, a death color almost okay like it just this very ghoulish deathly green and black obviously represents death and, and I shouldn't even say represents because we know from the hours of 12 p uh, 12 noon to 3 p.m on Good Friday, the sky was black. As uh, Luke tells us, the sun's light failed. When your father pulls away, when when the creator pulls away, everything left is darkness. You know, creation doesn't stand a chance without the creator. So that's what we get a sense of from 12 to 3. And, and again, Grunewald captures this. Um, one of the art historians I read said, oh, see, this takes place at night. No, it doesn't take place at night. What he's showing is that darkness, the, the sun's light failed. This is the creator pulling away, forsaking his own son for us. Profound language. Now, um, the other tones and everything I want to point out, um, again, you can see very similar to the predella, where Jesus, kind of that green hue matches the garden color in the background. So old Adam and new Adam. Here you see again the, the earth. Jesus' skin tone matches very closely the earth around him, the dirt, right? Out of the dirt man was created. From dust you were created to dust you shall return. Well, Jesus is kind of reversing the curse. He's becoming the curse for us. Really cool stuff. So now, again, you know, I, I, I just want to focus you. You can even see the, the green bluish green kind of ghoulish lips of death that Grunewald captured on Jesus covered in these pockmarks of 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 uh, plague and death we do not have a high priest that can't relate to us right he became just he knows every level of sorrow just like we do every bit of it and if you look there you just even his his lips are this this hue of death it is uh it's haunting it's haunting to look at it's mesmerizing um through the eyes of faith it's beautiful it really is now when you open up that panel right so you closed it's all it's all darkness and and oh you know it, it's heartrending to see what god did for us when you open up the panel remember what's on the far side there the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrected Christ, you know, in all his glory that you see there. Now notice, uh, he still bears the wounds of the crucifixion, doesn't he? And he shows them forth. Peace, right? That's the first words out of his mouth on Easter Sunday. He appears to those self-quarantined disciples who are hiding out of fear. And the first word out of his mouth to them from, back from the grave, the first word is peace. And he shows them his wounds and he says, peace again. 
eight days later, what does he do? He appears again to these room of disciples and he tells Thomas, go ahead and touch my wounds and see and believe. You know, stop disbelieving is what he says. Do you notice how the resurrected Christ in all his glory, it's like he almost doesn't even match the crucified Christ in a way. It's like it's, it's almost unrecognizable from Predella Jesus, from the, the um, Jesus on the cross with his hands in writhing agony. Here you see our great high priest with his hands lifted up in glory, still showing those resurrection wounds, but... Um, Life doesn't even compare to death, does it? It's like it's you can't even draw a comparison. The resurrected Christ almost doesn't even look like the crucified Christ, and yet he does. So you see, the again, this beautiful language. Here's the victorious Christ putting down sin, death, and the grave. You see all the enemies uh, with their swords and everything sprawled out before him. The, the tomb rent asunder. Guys, here's our victory, the Romans 6 language, right? Which, by the way, is read at the beginning of every good Lutheran funeral that you'll ever, at least every good Lutheran funeral I do. This is the very opening word, the first words you hear. We begin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then we read these words. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Where am I going with this, guys? You see, closed panel, open panel, crucified Christ, resurrected Christ. It's all about Christ. If we have been baptized into a death like his, we will also be baptized in a resurrection like his. His victory is our victory. Where am I going with this, guys? You know, <clears throat> look at what's going on in our world. We do have a high priest who can relate, right? In every way, shape, and form, it's not like we have somebody who just, you know, Jesus doesn't know what's going on. It's different in my time. How absolutely wrong, how absolutely asinine. We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect, every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. COVID-19, you really think your Lord doesn't know anything about, about disease? I mean, this is why I love Grunewald's painting portraying Jesus covered in plague. We complain that we're... We're, we, you know, we have to do a little quarantining, and you know? we can't go to Walmart and buy a year's worth of uh, supply of toilet paper. We have somebody who's been there, done. You know, and like I said, we dare to cry out, "My God, why have you forsaken me?" As if, you know, Jesus can't relate to us. But man, we've had it so bad. You know, you look. Uh, we can't go to our restaurants. Uh, we might take a little pay hit, something like that. Guys, we have a high priest who's been tempted, who's gone through everything far worse than we ever will on this side of eternity. He's the only one who's ever been truly forsaken. And yet he's gone through all of this far worse than what we're going through. He's gone through all of it, and yet he wasn't tempted. He hasn't fallen to the snares of the devil. Um, we can't say that so much, can we? Here's where I want to put your focus on, and it's a very appropriate for Easter. Let's focus on the resurrected Christ. And I leave you with these words out of Ecclesiastes. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. And then you have these outstanding words from Romans again, guys. There's nothing new under the sun. We have been baptized into Christ's death. We have also been baptized into a resurrection like his whether you live, whether you die, and everything in between, guys, you belong to Christ. So I do hope that that um, puts things into perspective for you as you make your way through this veil of tears that we dare to call life. Stay focused on Christ. Stay focused and rejoice because you belong to him. Amen.